We are back, Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network and the three baseball Meshuganas are together again, all in the same booth and with a guest. So let me introduce Alan Blumkin, a baseball Meshugana. Um, and I, as I say, I'm a, a baseball Meshugana, so that's two. Uh, the third one is our professor, Mr. Peter Golenbach. How are you, yes, sir? sir? We're here. Great day, great and, day uh, in baseball today. The Rays finally won a game. Yay. <laughs> well, well Mazel That's Tuff, happened Mazel sometime, Tuff. right? <laughs> you got Duda. I'm sure you're happy with Duda. My met We're happy with guy. Duda. Duda, Duda, yes. Very happy. Yes. Yes. A good uh, defensively as well. You'll like him, and um, I'm happy for you because uh, right. He just he just forgot to hit. That's all. Dude, I forgot to hit for a little while. I just forgot how to do that. Yeah, well, it was those little things. Yeah. That, um, and thankfully, you're patient, right? I'm very patient. You can tell. Good. <laughs> oh yes, I can tell. Um, our guest, who uh, has been a wonderful addition to these airwaves, guests all the time, um, Bill Hall from the extreme Upper West Coast. How you doing, Bill? Welcome back. I'm great. I am great. Yeah, this is your I first time thrilled. on the Golan Bob Show. And, yeah, I'm um, thrilled by that. Uh, well, um, we're thrilled to have you. Yes, thrill. Um, we're all thrilled. Um, we're going to play a little game that I thought would be fun. Bill is writing a book on a, a fictional book based on the premise that the Dodgers stayed in New York, and I'm assuming in your mindset that the Giants are going to stay along with them. Am I correct? Actually, no. They end up going to Minneapolis, which is where Horace Stoneham appeared to be headed before uh, Walter O'Malley persuaded him that they should head out west in tandem, especially because the National League pretty much laid down a condition that if one team was going to go to the West Coast, two had to go. I don't know where this came into my mindset, but St. Paul was a minor league team of the Dodgers back in those days and did O'Malley kind of hold that over um, Stoneham and not that Stoneham couldn't have been forced to do anything he was more of a sheep than uh, a diabolical uh, (laughs) Cretan uh, as was O'Malley but um, was that part of it the St. Paul um, franchise being a minor league franchise well, that, that's a good question, and I've got to admit, I don't know the quest, the answer to that. You know, back in those days, in the American Association, yes, St. Paul was a Dodger franchise, but uh, Minneapolis was giant territory, so I assume if they had gone to Minneapolis, they would have had to work out a territorial payment with the Dodgers for the loss of St. Paul. But uh, well, it's, it's, that, Let me interrupt you for a second. I, yeah. I interviewed Stoneham about that. Mm-hmm. For for my bum's book, uh, somebody gave me Stoneham's telephone number, and I called the number, and he picked up. It was fairly amazing. Wow! And basically, wow. what he said to me was that he was headed to Minneapolis. That's where he wanted to go. What he didn't say was that he wanted to leave the African Americans behind and go to the whitest place that he could find. He didn't say that, but that's what he was doing. <laughs> and so, so I did to it. though. So I said to him, when when O'Malley called you and said he was going to L.A. and would you want to go to San Francisco, I said, how did you feel about that? He said, he said that sounded fine to me. <laughs> it was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah, it, it wasn't a deep thinking kind no, of guy. No, no, and, and my suspicion is it happened exactly the way he said it to me. O'Malley said, I want to go to L.A., and if you go to San Francisco, we'll have our rivalry, and and we'll have, you know, a lot of attendance. We'll make a lot of fans, 
And he said, yeah, that's a fine idea. Because had he gone to Minneapolis, there would have been no great, you know, shakes in doing that. They'd have been, right, he was you know, losing money in New York. It wasn't like he had the most successful franchise in the National League going, like O'Malley did. So yeah, they came so green down O'Malley's part. Pardon me, Alan? They drew uh, about 600000 each of the last two years uh, they were here. The Giants did. Yeah. Yeah. They were pitiful. Um, there is a case that can be made, though, with both the Dodgers and the Giants, that they kept players in the minor leagues, did the Giants especially. Oh, yeah. Um, the yeah, data boards. That, the, yeah. And they, they, had, they retarded their progression so that they wouldn't win and um, prolong the agony of um, – dealing with the situation. I don't know how. I don't know. I, 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 I'm skeptical about that. I, I'm that seems, good. that just seems awfully yeah, as well, diabolical all as they were. All of a sudden, That's they had this tremendous rookie class of 1958. Exactly, with Cepeda and Davenport the and, 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 really and all those. They went out to San Francisco where Willie Mason and Johnny Antonelli. That was it. Right. And um, they developed a ton. They were competitive within a few years. And um, they were competitive in '58. They were competitive. And '59, they bring up. No, I'm sorry. Covey and go to Cepeda, and they had an abundance yeah. of outfielders: the Kirklands and the the Daddy Wags and the and those guys. Know, Lou was there, and the Cepeda was there, and the Davenport was there, and the Catcher Bob right. was there. All of a sudden, these these guys come up. Uh, you know, the first year out in San Francisco. Now, Peter, you seem s- skeptical. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's no. a, that, you know. Um, I mean, I, it's 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 something O'Malley might have done because he was he was really you know a rep scallion. <laughs> I, I never saw I never saw Stoneham that way. I, I always saw Stoneham as, as, as sort of this this. Uh, he, he he loved his team. He was a drunk. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure whether he cared all that much whether the team won or lost. That's the funny thing. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just an emotion that I have. It just, just doesn't sound right. Well, um, you could think about good things about the man. He was quick to integrate. Yes, he was. And yes, he was. And he had. He had the the first all uh, they called the colored den. It became Negro and black, African American. Call it what you want. There were three blacks playing in the same outfield for the first time in the World Series when um, Mueller got hurt and they moved yep. uh, Hank Thompson to right. Yep. And the, even the press was joking with racial epitaphs the New York press, um, little ditties about um, describing the three. It was, it was unusual to be racially progressive. Bill Veck, Stoneham, yeah. uh, naturally Branch Rickey. Right. But um, uh, how many more can you name from baseball that really, besides those three, um, that really didn't care. Perini. The Boston and, Braves. The Boston yes, Braves. Yes, Perini. Yes, Perini. Exactly. Well, no, before – was he in Boston, Perini? Who was the guy there before Perini? Uh, oh, Perini. Sam, Perini. Sam Jethro. Guy. Sam Jethro got signed by the Braves very, very early. So he was put – Right, and that was, was by Perini. He was Dodger I'm property. So I'll ask Alan Blumkin right. for – I'll ask the, the fact checker. Yeah. Was Perini there when – Oh, yeah, Jethro Perini was on. part of the – Three steam shovels. Okay. They bought the team, I think, in 1945 uh, or 46. They were there when okay. they Okay, so it was Perini then who. And they were, the, they brought... were the owners when they moved to Milwaukee. Okay. And Jethro right. came up, and obviously Hank Aaron came up. Yeah. And then Wes Covington and, and some Crow of the other people. Uh, and George Crow. Yep. Yeah. And Bruton, yep. Billy Bruton. Yeah, Billy, so yeah that was in Milwaukee. Uh, you know, yep. he, Milwaukee, they had. Uh, Billy Bruton, they had Jim Pendleton, who they got from the Dodgers. 
mm-hmm. also. And all these guys came up and starred before the Yankees brought up Elston Howard. Yeah, on the and White Sox. And long before also. They, the Red Sox brought up Pumpsy Green. Yeah, so, the White Sox had um, also. Yes, Minoso, that was a vex. Well, time. I mean, it was not a coincidence that very shortly thereafter, the National League started winning 10 or 11 All-Star games in a row. Yeah, Richie Ashburn was very blunt when they asked him why the Wizards didn't win anymore. Sure. Uh, Pants after 1950 said no blacks. That's right. Exactly. You got Frank Robinson in Cincinnati. Yeah. You had Ernie Banks in Chicago. Uh, yeah. Exactly. You had all yeah. these wonderful, you had Roberto Clemente who comes up to Pittsburgh. Uh, thanks you know, the same could have been oh. said about St. Louis, but all of a sudden they had Gibson and Flood oh. and all those guys. That was later. They turned them around. That was the later. Book, Peter. Mid-50s that was later, but it, st- it still was a what was and is. Um, where the, it took the Red Sox much longer to catch up. Well, the Red um, Sox, the Red Sox. If you want to talk about a team, the Red Sox were. The most racist of all the teams. There's this absolutely fantastic book. I've got it sitting here on my bookshelf by Howard Bryant. Oh, yeah, I have that all Just, yeah. you know, if you want yeah. to know about the Red Sox and race, you must go to your bookstore or, or, or yeah, I have library that. Yeah. And, and read Howard Bryant's book. Um, you know, not only do people talk about, of course, when, when Jackie Robinson and these two other black players tried out at – Fenway Park, and either Yorkie or or the general manager at the time, who was Joe Cronin, or the manager, one of those three people screams, get those niggers off the field. I mean, that's the most famous right. of the negative parts of it. The other part of it people don't seem to know about was that one of the Red Sox scouts went down to Birmingham and specifically told Cronin, that for four thousand five hundred dollars, they could sign this absolutely phenomenal ball player by the name of Willie Mays, and they told him, "Forget it." The the the, the Red Sox could have had Willie Mays, Dom DiMaggio, and Ted Williams in the same outfield for a bunch of years, and I guarantee you, the Red Sox would have won some pennants. They didn't do Good it. Question. Uh, yet they were things. so slow to integrate that. Um, but good news right along I, the the humanity front, they are considering removing the name of Yawkey Way or Yawkey Avenue, whatever it is that's adjacent to uh, Fenway, given the fact that Yawkey was that racist. He was mm-hmm. the top. When all these guys answered, when the pinky – Higgins yep. of the world answered yep. to the top. It was Yorkie who made these decisions. You can't, you know, Cronin was a racist, but, but Yorkie was the main yeah, guy. Yeah, but Cronin was a terrible back. racist. He was a terrible right. racist. They were honoring Jackie Robinson when Cronin was the president of the American League, and Cronin refused to come out onto the field until the ceremony was over. That's oh, how much of a racist Cronin was. It was just he awful. was. I did, I think of him as a, um, a northeastern, you know, Boston guy. He wasn't. He was South no. Carolina or something. Absolutely. And he, he was, was a was South a, Carolinian who married the owner's daughter. He was originally signed by the Washington Senators. He helped lead the Senators to penance in 1924 and 1925. He married the owner's daughter. And at uh, a certain point... He wasn't up in the 24 and 25. No, it wasn't, that wasn't Crow. Uh, he came up originally at the Pirates. He had a cup of coffee with the Pirates. But he was on that 33 team. He okay, married... Okay, uh, okay that's Florida. right. That's he married right. Griffith's daughter. Absolutely right. And then Griffith sold him right. in, in 1934, right. I think it was, sold huh? him to the Red Sox for uh, $250,000. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, and, that, and there was a whole internecine relationship between the, the Red Sox and the original Washington Senators for years. Not quite as graphic as the Yankees and the Kansas City A's, but there, right. it was pretty graphic. It was. And the interesting thing about the Washington Senators 
was that Clark Griffith, who was the owner of the Senators, at one point seriously thought about bringing up Satchel Paige and, and, and the great catcher, um, uh, Gibson. Josh Gibson, Gibson. Uh, Josh Gibson, and a couple of the other Negro League All-Stars, and then got cold, feet, got cold feet and backed out. The Homestead Grace were renting, uh, renting right. the uh, ballpark when the Senators were on the road, and uh, from the accounts for this guy David Hopler, and uh, uh, there was a book that came out uh, uh, several years ago on this topic that he was making too much money off the rental by the Homestead Grays. Oh, uh, wow. To, to, that he, wanted, you know, he, he was making too much money to take. Uh, he could have had Gibson and Buck Leonard, and you're right, yeah. a few of the other top black ball players. Exactly. And oh, but but getting Alvin back Griffin, getting... Yeah, wait, let's get back to Yorkie for just a second. It's an yeah. interesting thing oh, okay. what they're talking about. Uh, uh, um, John Henry is the owner of the Red Sox, and he is the one, actually, after Charleston and after the controversies about tearing down the Robert E. Lee statues and, and the statues of, the, of these Confederate generals and of um, Jefferson Davis and so forth and so on, uh, it was he who brought this up. It just seemed that, you know, in an age where racism is going so so crazy right now, um, that the anti-racism forces want to do something. They they want to get rid of the 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 appearance symbolism. of racism. Yeah, the symbolisms of racism. And and somebody suggested that they rename that road after Big Poppy. And it wouldn't surprise me if they did if, if they did that. Because David Ortiz was, for a lot of years, the face of the Boston Red Sox. After all of that racism, after all of that anti-black nonsense, David Ortiz came up to the Red Sox and became the face of the Red Sox, oddly enough. Well, incredible. You know who I feel sorry for, just off the top of my head? Who's that? The shortstop that they were comparing to Jeter and and. Uh, Ramirez, and I can't even think of his name right now, who was hurt the year they won the world, the first World Series. Garcia Parra? Yeah. Garcia Parra. No more Garcia Parra. Yeah. His no more Garcia star Parra. kind of shot down really quickly. Uh, very much so. Many, That's true. That's very I don't true. Garcia that. Parra was an all-star player and an all-star player until the day he wasn't. And then the, the day they replaced him that year in 2004 – and brought up this fabulous little shortstop nobody ever heard of, that guy was the guy who took the Red Sox to the pennant. And Garcia Parra was out. Right. You're absolutely right. That really shows what sport is all about, that you get hurt. There's somebody waiting in the wings to Wally Pip you. If you no will. question. <laughs> no question about it. It's, it's one of the millions of things that makes the game of baseball so interesting. All sports that in that regard, absolutely. Um, if you will, guys, I'd like to get to the premise of... Yes, let's um, get back to Bill Hall. And, and and <laughs> no, let's start with Bill Hall. What's, uh, give me, of course, not specifically, give me uh, something to tease me about your book, about the premise of the Dodgers staying in Brooklyn. Okay, how it happens in a nutshell. I started off with at least a couple of interviews that Walter O'Malley gave. He disclosed the fact that Joe Kennedy Sr., uh, father of uh, John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, was seriously interested in buying into the Dodger ownership group at one point, but uh, backed away for various reasons. So I got to thinking, well, what might be a premise that would lead to Joe Kennedy pursuing that purchase with a little more vigor, shall we say? And so now I've, in my novel, the first big historical change happens in 1944 when the eldest son, Joe Kennedy Sr., does not get blown up on a reconnaissance mission over England piloting a yeah, a flying bomb, but instead bails out in time to survive that crash, to fulfill his destiny to be elected 
to Congress and run for the position of President of the United States. That leaves son number two needing something to do, uh, John Kennedy. So in my book, uh, the J JFK ends up in charge of the Dodgers, which of course, and Walter O'Malley ends up being forced out, which of course uh, sets off a whole cascade of other changes, including uh, Brand Tricky continuing as general manager, Bert Schotten not being forced out in 1950, and on and on. And some Japanese baseball owner lost his kid in World War II, and uh, that changed the franchise of Japanese baseball concurrently. Interesting. Um, I did perhaps. not know that. Huh. Yeah, oh. well, Joseph, Joseph oh, Kennedy oh, shot him down. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So that's what fantasy is all about. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, sort of like, sure. you know, if you ever read books about what if Hitler uh, had won in, and the Axis had won World War II, what if the South had won the Civil War, what if JFK had not been assassinated. You know, there have been a few baseball books on this theme, not too many. Uh, actually, I do have a couple on my shelves uh, based on the premise that uh, Bill Veck uh, did uh, bring Negro Leaguers into baseball during World War II, and uh, those are pretty entertaining. Uh, there's, there's a novel another... that I have, The Man Who Brought the Dodgers Back to Brooklyn. Yes, by David by Ritz. David published Ritz. In... Yes. yes. An interesting guy, David, David Ritz, who, who, who writes most of his books about celebrities. Uh, he's a Los Angelino. And, and mostly does books with celebrities. But he wrote that book. I thought it was a very interesting book. Yeah, I, I, I love the premise. Some of it seemed a little more fantastic than other parts, but uh, I think his love for the Brooklyn Dodgers comes through. You know, he also collaborated with um, uh, Ralph Branca on his autobiography. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. For yeah, and for people who aren't familiar with the book, it came out in 1981. It's set in the year 1988. And a uh, young billionaire manages to acquire the Dodgers franchise, and after uh, operating it for one year in um, in uh, Los Angeles, he manages to persuade the National League to let him move the Dodgers back to Brooklyn and rebuild Ebbets Field. And right. uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of rollicking fun. So my premise is different: that the Dodgers stay put, and. Uh, very different uh, endings for most of the stories, but I'll, I'll tell people I don't turn them into a National League uh, version of the Yankees winning with monotonous regularity for any <laughs> for year after year. I think Dodger fans would love it, but everybody else would find it to be a snore. So, you know, they still battle some adversity, but... Uh, you know, they stay on, and uh, I, I, I hope it'll be an entertaining read for people. Well, you, you certainly have a market. I don't think there are any teams, uh, fans of teams who have left, uh, not there anymore, even in general, more rabid fans to this day, and we're talking about 50-odd years later, than Dodger fans. I was a Giant fan, but I don't see – see that many giant fans going nuts and yeah to this uh, I mean, my question you know the novel that peter just mentioned is anybody ever going to write a book called the man who brought the giants back to new york probably not <laughs> right <laughs> no. The, the, no the big question though because to me branch ricky was probably the most brilliant executive baseball executive in baseball history no As you know, he started with the St. Louis Browns, and the Browns owner made the mistake of letting him go to the Cardinals, where he then started the farm system and, and just made the Cardinals into a, a top, top team. He comes over to the Dodgers, and he gets a one-third ownership of the Dodgers. Uh, Walter O'Malley has one-third, and a fellow by the name of John Smith. And I don't know much about John Smith, but he's the third owner. And I would have thought that Ricky would have been smart enough to cozy up to John Smith and his wife so that if something ever happened, that they would sell their share of the Dodgers to him. 
when in fact, when John Smith died, O'Malley cozied up to the widow and got uh, Mrs. Smith to sell that one-third ownership of the Dodgers to O'Malley. Now, my question yeah. would have been, what would the history of baseball have been like if Ricky had gotten Smith to sell his one-third share to him? Yeah, that could have very easily happened, and that could have, uh, I'm sure, would have kept the Dodgers in Brooklyn as well. You know, John Smith was the president and chairman of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, the good folks who have given us penicillin and Viagra and other blood wow. wonder drugs. Wow. And he loved that. baseball, and he just kind of stayed in the background compared to uh, – Ricky and um, and O'Malley. All the reading I've done has said that he indicated that he was, uh, you know, kind of the pivot between them. That he didn't clearly side with one or the other. But unfortunately, toward the end, he was siding more with O'Malley on business decisions. Apparently, uh, the rather ill-advised venture of Branch Ricky into uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers football team cost the organization a lot of money, and mm -hmm. John Smith wasn't happy about that. And, uh, you know, I'm just rereading Lee Lowenfish's great uh, biography of Branch Rickey, and there's one quote in there about how O'Malley, with his, uh, how can I say, dubious charms, was courting uh, Mary Smith, and at one point a sports writer overheard uh, O'Malley say to Mary Smith, uh, Mary, you don't want to turn the business over to that farmer, do you? You know, referring oh, wow. to, uh, referring to uh, the background of Ricky growing up on an Ohio farm, when in fact, uh, in my mind, uh, Branch Ricky would not be... Uh, fit to, I mean, that uh, Walter O'Malley would not be fit to wipe the cow dung off of uh, Branch Rickey's shoes. That's very true. Wow. That's a, that's a very, very interesting story. Wow. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, what are your plans to get your novel published, Bill? Uh, I haven't really tackled that yet. I've got a couple of uh, publishers in mind that uh, uh, specialize in uh, baseball books, uh, I've received encouragements from several folks, including uh, including from Peter. Just write the story, let, let get the story done, get it out. That's the first job, and then uh, go looking, hopefully, for an opportunity to get it published. If if nothing else, at least in this day and age, it's pretty easy to self-publish, and uh, hopefully through Facebook and the comfortably zoned radio network and other friendly outlets, I could get the word out about it. Beautiful. Yeah, you have airtime anytime you want. What what pipes, huh, on Bill Hall? Uh, I'm an old radio guy before I got into local politics. Uh, when I was very young, they told me uh, I had a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old business joke. but what Bill, you're in Lincoln, Lincoln City or Lincoln County? Is, or is Lincoln, Lincoln City County, City, Oregon, County. which, yes, as a matter of fact, is... Uh, Ground zero for the eclipse, the very first, uh, on Monday the uh, 21st, the very first uh, spot in the continental United States that will be darkened by the eclipse is the little town of Depot Bay. Wow. So Very cool. Yeah. And um, that's extremely West Coast. It is. You have a little back is. east. At all, Bill? Only uh, while well, I was attending graduate school. So you may be wondering how a guy from Oregon falls in love with the Brooklyn Dodgers, a team that disappears uh, that disappeared two years before he was born. Well, right. you know, started off with 1969. Ten, I'm 10 years old. That's the first year I really intensely follow baseball. And I fell in love with the New York Mets, who were managed by a guy named Hodges. And so I started learning more about Gill's history and the history of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And, you know, then a few years later, uh, the Boys of Summer came out. And then a few years after that, uh, a terrific history, uh, one of my favorite books ever, called Bums, came out by 
a guy named Golenbach, and so I just plunged deeper and deeper into the lore and history of this amazing franchise and these amazing men, and it's been quite a journey. I've gotten to know through Facebook uh, all of Gil Hodge's children a few weeks ago. I had a chance to visit uh, Anderson, Indiana, and spend about uh, three hours in person with uh, Carl Erskine, which was... A true thrill. Yep. Oisk from yeah. Fort Worth. <laughs> He's one of the great people. Erskine is just one yeah. of the great, great, great people. He's one of those people who made it easier for Jackie Robinson on the Dodgers. Oh, yes. At Fort Worth, am I correct? Yeah. Well, no, he, they, they weren't together at Fort Worth, but uh, he came up no, from but Fort he, Worth. He came over to his. he came over oh. to the Fort Worth dugout to yes. commend uh, Erskine on his uh, prowess and how he said, you're going to be a Dodger next year and this, that, and the other thing. And he really encouraged him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they played an exhibition game uh, coming up, you know, That's coming right. back from spring training or something Bill, like that. do you that. ever meet Newcomb? Never have, unfortunately. I hope that can happen someday. I mean, he here he is still with us in his 90s as well, which is wonderful. Yeah. and. Isn't Tommy Lasorda about to turn 90? Yeah, I think he is yeah. this year. Amazing. Yep. At some point, yeah. Um, hey, so that you can have, have a show um, with all of us looking back to those days without saying, rest in peace, Jerry Lewis. Yeah. Wow. That's true, too. Yeah. Who was yeah. a very good friend of Gil Hodges and the Hodges family. Uh, you know, one of the stories from Gil's days as a manager both with the Washington Senators and the New York Mets. Uh, he collected all the player fine money, but at the end of the year, instead of throwing a party or refunding it, he turned around and donated it all to the Muscular Dystrophy Association. That's right. Wow. Hey, Bill, we're going to have you on the Washington Senator Show next Sunday, if you can make it at noon Eastern time. And talk well, about Bill Hodges, who managed the uh, second Washington Senators. All very confusing. The things I want to know about how a team um, can move from Washington to Minnesota and how it, they can sell the idea of having a team in Washington as an expansion team when a team didn't make it and moved out. But uh, you can enlighten us on politics. Politics, politics Ralph. <laughs> Have you ever heard yes. of politics? Yeah, yeah, I think it was pure uh, politics. I'm very, but I'm not not very political. political. I can tell you the answer to that one. The congressman, uh-huh. the president, exactly, yeah. they were furious. They were absolutely furious that their beloved team was, was, was you know, darted out of town in the middle of the night and ran off to, right. to Minnesota. If they wanted to so keep their, their antitrust exemption, exactly. they better bring another team back, and they did. Peter said that right in the head. Mm-hmm. Right yeah, in the hey, head. That answers my question. Uh, yeah, and I think uh, by long giving it. wondered how, how Major League Baseball could uh, put up with that, but out of the fear of losing that coveted antitrust. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And I think by giving them the name Senators, it was an attempt to maybe persuade the uninformed that, oh, yeah, everything's fine. The Washington Senators are still here, even though all of a sudden Armin Killebrew is hitting home runs in Minnesota instead of in Mm -hmm. D.C. Ironic, I do do like the idea of an eminent domain for, for a team. A city should have the Brooklyn Dodgers or the Dodgers. But on the other hand, this co- this made it crazy making. Um, well, it's interesting that major league sports are doing that now. For instance, the Cleveland Browns name. The NFL decreed that the name Browns would stay in Cleveland, and the new franchise right. got the name and the history. And also, the NBA have said that if has said that if and when a, a franchise comes back to Seattle, it will be the new Seattle SuperSonics. Yeah, I wonder how long it'll take the New Jersey Jets to sell that name to somebody in Cucamonga. Uh, <laughs> just. Anyway, guys, I love it as usual. 
uh, you're all tremendous. Um, we'll be back next week. Same, say it, Alan. All right. Okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. Say, your, say how we'll be back. i got to hear it. Okay. Same bad time, same bad channel. I know. It's simplistic, <laughs> but it's music to my ears. If anybody understands how much I love having Alan on, um, you'll, you'll get it. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Bill Hall, our guest. And uh, we'll all be back next week. Adios, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye now.